Restaurants.
Oh, 
is all I see. When your eyes are on this child, your grace allows to me. Sing it again. Oh Lord, you're beautiful.
You're the one who sets my spirit free. Use me, Lord. Glorify your holy name through me. Separate me from this world, Lord. Sanctify my life for you can change me to your image. Help me bear good fruit. And every day you're drawing closer. Trials come to test me.
one of you more Each passing day I love you Lord. With all my heart I just want to say With all my heart I just want to say With all my heart I just want to say treasures you give us hope tonight Lord as we go into your word I ask that you would make us able to grasp what this means your value of us so Lord speak to our hearts speak to our soul tonight we we come with our our hearts and minds open this simple message we're going to cover Lord just give us ears to hear it heart to receive it in Jesus name amen the title of the message tonight is Our Value to God. Hard to believe that he would value us, but he does. I want to preface this by saying I, I often teach, you, you know my doctrines, even if you don't agree with them all, you know that I, I often teach somewhat against self-value, certainly self-exaltation like we see with Lucifer, but more than that, I, I don't even get into self-esteem. And I've been criticized before at times and people say, well, no, you just need to believe in yourself. You need to have some self seems positive self image and all these things. But I have found absolutely I don't see that. But people mistake. They think I'm in some, some kind of depression. Stephen has some issues. He has some problems. He's not in touch with reality, whatever. But it's that the value system that I believe in my value will never come from me. My value is what he places in me. That's the anointing. The anointing is his value manifested on you. It's his signature written on you. And so yesterday I was meditating, praying, and I really believe if we gain an understanding of how valuable we are to God, we'll grow stronger, we'll be wiser, more sensitive to the spirit. And so that's what this message is basically about. It's not gonna take very long. Uh, we're going to start reading Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. But... Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Now, these verses are not, not usually put together, but they are together. It is congruent and straight through. And I see it as a, a, anecdotal to what he's saying about the value of the Father for us. And also embedded in this simple passage is how we can cause that value to increase. Uh, how many of you want to 
become more valuable to God. Who wouldn't? Who doesn't want that? Well, there are things we can do. There are some attributes about God's value. As I studied and found the scriptures, I discovered that there's always something connected to them. The value that God has for us has a lot to do with the things that we do. Now, we know we have a covenant of grace, but the value of an individual above another, you have friends, some are more valuable than others. And if you ask yourself a simple question, why are some more valuable? It's because of something they have done for you, some way they've helped you, some way they've loved you. Maybe, maybe um, they, they did something kind to your family. Whatever the case, there are people that you call special and that you love and believe and your value of them goes up higher. Well, this is the same way it works in the relationship with God. Yes, we are created in His image and His likeness. Yes, we have a covenant of grace. But it's the same with the anointing. You know, how do you, how do you get the anointing? Uh, how do you get the anointing? Well, you get it by serving God, submitting to God, giving Him everything. And that's what causes his value of you to increase. So in this message, I want to reflect on that fact. We're going to see five facts about how God values us. This is sort of our worth to God. And no, we don't have to repay him. We don't owe anything to get salvation. He saves us. He loves us no matter what. I'll never forget when I was first called to go to the mission field and my wife and I um, he gave us that option to have that house. You've heard the story a few times, a beautiful house and two-car garage, built-in swimming pool, trampoline, copper spaniels running around, the white picket fences, you know, just, just a dream, like an American dream house. And the Lord told us he would give us that. He said, because I love you, if you want that, I will give it to you. You can, you can have anything or you can choose my will for your life. And I remember being quite shocked that it was not like the enemy was there. This was God speaking to my heart. He told me and convinced me whether I obeyed him or not, his love would remain. And if I did my own thing, he would still love me. And he would bless me and give me all those things. And that's a beautiful aspect of God. But in regards to what I see his value over us, that's what this message is about. What can we do? What do we do that causes our value to him to increase? And the first one is that God values us because we are his treasure. Let's just start with that in Exodus 19.5. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. I like the idea of being his, not just possession, but his treasured possession possession, something that he really sees separate and more valuable. God does have degrees of value. He has degrees of assessing people, their value, what he expects from them, that the principle of the talents shows it very clearly. He did not give an equal portion of talents to each person. He already knew more or less what they maybe could handle or not handle. And it's a good thing he gave the one to the one that he suspected would not value the process as much but he wants us to be his treasured possession i want to i want to show you one of my favorite scriptures in the bible malachi chapter three no i'm not teaching on tithing because that's what everybody thinks when they think malachi three this is in verse 16 it says then those who feared the lord talked with each other and the lord listened and heard i want to stop there for a second the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We fear God because he can put us in the lake of fire. We fear God because he has the ability to do anything. He's God. And that's a healthy place to start. Our fear of him becomes wisdom that starts. So we fear him and then we speak about him. Like right now, I'm speaking to you about God. And according to this passage, as I'm doing that, I fear him, you fear him. That's why we gather here. As I'm expressing things to you about him, he's listening. The Lord has never missed a sermon that I've preached. He's never not shown up for a church service that I've conducted. When it's just me in chairs, God is there. God is there. And, and if I'm speaking out of my fear for him and my love for him, he listens 
and he hears, it's the difference between those two words in the Hebrew, listening and hearing are two things. Hearing is, listening is just opening your ear. Hearing is understanding. You hear me? You ever tell someone that? You hear what I'm saying? In other words, do you comprehend it or are you understanding? So he's carefully listening to us and he hears it. It goes on to say a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Now, this is not an analogy. This is a fact, a scroll of remembrance. Now, what a scroll is in eternity, I don't know. If it's some kind of data storage device that's in heaven, I don't know if he has hard drives or however he records things, but we know that heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will never pass away. So these things are written down. He said, not even one comma or period will pass from the law before all things are fulfilled. So he records information, but this says that a special storage of information takes place when we talk about him, when we fear him, when we we love him when we honor his name. And being that now he has a document about our conversations and he's recording all of this, that means we already have a foothold in eternity. There's stuff written about us up there. I think there's always been stuff written about us. I think a plan that he has first was written before the foundation of the world. But now we're amending, because of the way we treat him, we're amending the books there and new things are being written. Every time we gather, every time we honor him, every time we worship him. And this counts to his value of us. In other words, this is building his value of us when we do this. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they, these people, will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. See, from the very beginning of God's value of us, it, he sees us a treasure. As another translation, it says that we are his jewels. Same verses in Malachi, but his jewels. And, and he writes this down. There's documents about his, his love for us, his concern for us. He treasures us. And as we connect, you know, we become part of the church. We are redeemed people. We are called out, set apart for an intimate relationship with God. But God chooses us for that purpose because he values us. Because he has use for us. Now we're going to turn all of these over into that category. He doesn't just value us because he wants to value us. There's a reason why he's doing it. God does nothing without an ulterior motive. Everything, and don't take that in a negative way, it, everything he does has purpose. He doesn't just, you know, skip down the road, I don't know what I'm going to do today, what do you want to do? He, everything is purpose. You'll never see bored. God, God's not like tapping the throne up there like, mm, I don't know. I'm so tired of this. Everything is purpose. All things are purpose. So in his relationship with us, as he values us, he is bringing us to a place to appreciate his purpose for us. And our execution of said purpose is how we accrue the points of value. Those that obey, this is my beloved son, and him I am well pleased. I want to hear those words. I want to do the things he's called me to do, go to the places he's told me to go to, so that in that day, this will happen. There will be a distinction between me and other people, the, the righteous and the wicked. This is referencing Daniel in the book of Revelation, in the end, the goats and the sheep and the division between the two. The, there will be a distinction. You're going to know who's who, he's saying. You know why? Because as they've talked about me, as they've loved me and they've honored me, I've written this special scroll this information is probably the distribution of humans in the end. He's saying, no, we want to keep this as a keeper. This is a keeper. We're going to keep this one. It's like you go through a warehouse and, a, and an auction or a sale, and you have a little tag with your number on it, and you stick these stickers or these post-it notes on the items you want. That's, that's you redeeming those things. He marks us like that. Because we are his treasure. And as we connect with one another, 
and we spend time speaking about God, he's listening, he's hearing, and he develops this love for us that causes him to value us as his treasure. And this leads to our eventual distinction from the rest of the people of the world. There are many people who do not talk about the Lord. Many people who do not fear the Lord. Many people who do not. I, I, I got some new atheists. I keep getting new atheists. God just loves giving me atheists. And you know, she's a bisexual atheist. And she was talking to me like that's the first thing out of her mouth. And she said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm, a, I'm actually a pastor. I teach the Bible. Well, I'm bisexual and I'm an atheist. Like, oh, nice to meet you. You know, shake her hand. Well, I, they have to say that immediately. But later we talked a little bit. And part of the conversation was that um, she said, she said the words like, oh, God. And I said, why are you calling on someone you don't even believe in? And she said, what do you mean? I said, you just said, oh, God. Yeah, I did, didn't I? I said, maybe you're not as atheist as you think. And she could not say anything after that. I, I wrecked her. I wrecked her. She's, she's got in her head. I'm telling you, God's given me wisdom on how to deal with those atheists. But I'm praying for her soul to be saved. And God values the people who talk. What was interesting, though, is I was talking about the Lord out of my fear for the Lord with this atheist and with all the atheists I speak to. <coughs> and God writes that down in heaven. Stephen's talking to them. Remember the introductory scripture, whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my father, but whoever acknowledges me, I will acknowledge. That's where the value begins. I'm out there telling people, you are too. We tell people what we believe. And our value increases. We are his treasure for that reason. It leads to our distinction. In the end, sheep and the goats, we're going to be the sheep. The wheat and the tares, we're the wheat. We're going to be gathered into his barns and kept and preserved for eternity because we are his treasure. Number two, God values us because we bear fruit for him. Now, here's part of that ulterior motive. He wants us. He doesn't need us necessarily to do anything, but he wants us to do things for him, for the credit of his kingdom, for the expansion of his kingdom. John 15, 16, I like that it says, you did not choose me, Jesus says, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This relationship again, we see God chose us. We did not choose God. That's, that's value from the beginning. The fact that the Father has revealed to us, not flesh and blood, but the Father has revealed the Son to us, means that God already from the start values us, wants us, and our esteem, if any, we should not have self-esteem, but God esteem. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God values us, God chose us. Romans 7, 4 says, So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who raised, um, who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. That's our purpose. The, the, one of the reasons why he values us is because he wants and has designed for us to bear fruit, expand the kingdom. Bring the knowledge to atheists or to anybody. Speak the things that he's spoken to us as we talk about out of fear of the Lord. We say it, they hear it, and we can multiply. Bearing fruit just means a seed falling to the ground, dying, and then not abiding alone. Suddenly you have other people believing because of that he values that extremely. We are redeemed from the law and fashioned and trained by God to work for him in this life bearing fruit, leading up to eternity where we will continue to work. Another one of my favorite passages, Revelation 7, 14. He said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
God values us because His purpose must be accomplished through us. He needs us to do that. It wouldn't be unlike you having a company and you have employees. Some of them hide and, and, and play Candy Crush in the storage room on their phones instead of working. But some of them work very hard. Of course, you value them more. Why? Because they're being productive for you. And that's part of God's value system for us. God values us because we bear Him fruit. We are destined to serve Him forever. I love that passage. Serve Him day and night in His temple. And as I often point out, every encounter where God chooses to reveal Himself to man, there is a purpose. And that purpose is a function. And that function is service to God. And this will be every day for the rest of our life until we are in eternity, and it's not the sweet by and by where we'll just be laying in heavenly hammocks, swinging in the breeze, but we will be there functioning. I'm so excited about my new job. I can't wait to get up there. I don't know what he's going to assign to me, but he's going to give me some task, some function, some job or jobs. I would tend to believe that I'm going to have a much higher capacity in that form of myself than I do now. And I like to work for him, but how much more we will have no need to sleep or we can just work 20 for day and night. So it says day and night, we will serve him and serve him. So the value that begins here on earth will then grow into a value that is forever. He will value us as his own. We're his shepherd. He shelters us. Uh, we never again will hunger. We'll never thirst. All this because of our productivity for him because we bear fruit. Number three, God values us because we perpetuate his legacy. Psalm 102, 18 says, let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. So this is, of course, Psalms. Uh, the, the psalmist is being told, write these beautiful songs. And these songs that you're writing now will then be published and people who are not even created yet are going to be able to praise God, bring on another. The legacy will continue. Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips on the lips of your children and on the lips of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. So God values us for what we are as conveyors of information. In this case, this is us uh, teaching and sharing the information, us winning souls, reaching out to the lost. Throughout the scriptures, we see people carrying and speaking his words to others. The whole kingdom is set up in a transference of words. Words are imparted. We receive those words. We pass those words on. That was the last thing Jesus prayed. Father, you gave me the words. I gave the words to them. They received the words. I'm done. It was, a, it was a simple transaction. The words pass. Now, the perpetuation of his legacy is built upon that. We declare the works of the Lord. We preach. We teach. We prepare outlines and messages. We conduct meetings. Missions work we talked about last week uh, concerning Joe, Alicia, and what they're preparing to do. Missions work is not really hard. In function, it's pretty simple. Just find a room and talk about God in it, and you are a missionary. That's it. But you need to be consistent. The problem is people quit. Well, nobody came to the meeting. Well, you should be there. Stay there. Maybe they see. Well, I, 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 I was mocked by um, a woman, uh, uh, Cello, years ago, that she would, a bread saleswoman in Acapulco, she'd put this basket on her head and she would say, pan, pan. Bolillo telera, you know, she, uh, bolillo telera, that's different breads, and she'd sell. And she would walk by where we had this church meeting, and I would put that tent out there and put 75 chairs under that tent, and there'd be two people in the service. But I did it, kept on doing it, and for whatever reason, they didn't come. I, I couldn't stop. I, I couldn't allow myself to get discouraged. That's really what it is. Just stay. Eventually, they'll come. They'll come, and if they don't, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on earth. And this 
apparent idiot that's setting up a massive tent with all these chairs in the hot Acapulco sun every week. It took me, I had to wake up at 4.30 in the morning on Sundays, take me three and a half, four hours just to erect the tent, put everything in place for a 45 minute meeting. Just a few songs and praise and worship and then preaching. And then I'd have to break it all back down for the, for the first several months of it. Nobody helped me. Nobody offered. Nobody was like, hey, hey, would you like some help with that? They just gladly would come in, sit there, get up and walk off. And finally, I, I was exhausted. Sundays, I was sunburnt and exhausted. Sunday night, I was like passing out. And I just said, Lord, you know, I don't mind if you send some help. And the very next meeting, uh, one of the uh, neighbors said, hey, is it okay if I help you to break everything down? I said, yeah, please. So I gave him one and another guy saw him doing that and one by one. Then I ended up, to, toward the end, I, I did very little when it came to setting up or breaking down. Basically, I just pointed my finger and they did it. But that's the thing, that the perpetuation of the legacy of God is an, an involvement in a work that we, we occupy spaces and make declarations that's called church. Two or more gathered in that space, but you be consistent. You keep doing it. Throughout the scriptures, we see people doing that. The Bible is a very long storybook of people only transferring words to other people. Think about it. All the prophets were word people sharing words from God to them. That's all we do. That perpetuates his legacy. And he values that more than anything else. You feel it when you prepare a message and preach it. You feel his favor on you. You feel him saying, thank you. I'm glad you did that. He, he, you rise in your rank of importance to God as you do it. Number four. God values us because we are his desire. Now, this is mind blowing that he desires us. First John 4, 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God values us because he wants to. He actually desires to have us. He wants us. I, I said it all along, and, and I remember one time the Lord told me, he said, Stephen, I love your presence more than you love my presence. And when he told me that, it really shook me. I realized I have an idea sometimes that God's just putting up with me. And it's like, you, you need something? And he takes care of it. It's never. He's eager. He desires my fellowship. He desires time with me. He's seeking me out. He's looking for me. He wants that connection because he, he, he values us because he wants to. He wants to place that worth on us. And that comes from the Father, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So the Son came into the world that we might live through him, the former scripture said. And this is love. Not that we love God. Love in its origin and source is God's desire for us. He wants us. And if you ever feel down, if you ever feel sad... If you ever wrestling with depression, you know, play the violin. You know, did you ever see this? You know what this is? It's the world's smallest violin playing just for you. Don't, don't be depressed. Think about the fact that you are loved. You're valued. He, he, he wants you and he calls you. All these things we're seeing. You're his treasure. You bear fruit for him. You perpetuate his legacy and he desires you desperately wants to be with you all the time. And when you don't show up for the meeting, not the church meeting, I'm talking about you and him. When you don't show up for that because you're preoccupied with something else, I tell you the fact I know about my God, it hurts him. It hurts him. He, he is the most sensitive soul you'll ever meet. He is the most emotional individual I have ever known. He is, he's the most... He's, he's so easily bruised. He's so sensitive and gentle in his emotions that little things offend him. He's very sensitive. 
You think, well, but if he's God, he should be a big boy and not be such a whiny baby. No, he, is, he weeps over us when we don't respond. He wants us so desperately. All the prophets wrote so many things about his jealousy, about his anger that, that they did not stay faithful to him. They turned to idols. They did these things. It, it cut him to the quick. It, it bruised him. It hurt him. And he desperately wanted, desperately wanted us to be singular for him. He desires us, and if he desires us, if we desire him back, then we will we connect permanently. Let's go to the last one, number five. God values us because we are his temple. Now, here on earth, you know, the Bible says, uh, they will be my, I will be their God, and they will be my people, and I will dwell in them. He said, Jesus said throughout 14, 15, 16 of John, all about the Holy Spirit coming and about how, yes, he is with us, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be in us. So we are his dwelling space. This is perhaps the most valuable part of us to God. We are his tabernacle. We are his tent. We are his dwelling space. 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, do you not know that your bodies are temples? Of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Our physical body is a habitat in which he dwells. Ephesians 2.19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God values us because we are his dwelling space. And every morning you wake up, remember it. Caleb shared a great message on Thursday and talking about that connection and how, how God's spirit dwells in and how wonderful it is to have that. God wants that. God wants, God wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit more than we want him to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Very simply put. He's looking. The Father is looking for true worshipers, those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Not about locations or places, Jesus told the woman there in, in the Samaritan woman at the well. Told her, you know, it's not on this mountain or in Jerusalem. He's, he's got a new habitat. He has a new dwelling place. It's you. You are the container in which he wants. And that he values you, values you for that purpose. Amen. As I said, a simple message, just a reminder about the fact that you are valued by God. These passages, all of them, reflect the idea that human beings hold great value and significance to an almighty God, which is puzzling. I can, I can never wrap my head around that because he's so great and we're so not. Because he's so wonderful, so kind and so gentle and we are exactly the opposite. But... We are significant to him and we are cherished and intended to fulfill a special purpose in our relationship with the divine, with him. All these things are value to God. These are the five facts we saw. God values us because we are his treasure. Redemption is about separating, separating something off. We talk often one another. We fear him. He's got the scroll. It's written in heaven. God values us because we bear fruit for him. Yeah, that's what we should do. Treated does not bear fruit. Remember what Jesus did to the figless fig tree? He cursed it. The opposite of value. He had no value because it was not bearing fruit. We need to make sure that in some way or capacity we are bearing fruit because that's how our value will increase to God. God values us because we perpetuate his legacy. That's our job on earth is to not forget the benefits of God, but publish the information to everyone that we meet in every place that we go. And that includes Bali for Joe and Leisha. They're going to go and occupy spaces where every single week 
faithfully. The gospel is going to be shared. The messages that Joe receives, that Alicia receives, they're going to be sharing with many people. Many souls are going to get saved as a result of them. They're going to bear much fruit. I know it without a doubt. And they're going to perpetuate the legacy of God. Number four, we saw that God values us because we are his desire. He desires us. And I'm so grateful that he does. And number five, finally, God values us because we are his temple, his dwelling, his home. We always think about going into his temple. We always think about going into, into the refuge and hiding in him. But we are his, his refuge. We are his dwelling place. And gosh, I want that all the time. Amen? I want it all the time. I want to constantly be filled. Why don't we stand to our feet? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for the way you value us. We are important to you. Your favor is upon us. It's, it's very hard to comprehend because we just see ourselves from our perspective. It's hard to imagine that you would find so much value in sinful man, but you do. And we're so grateful, so grateful, Lord, that, that you, you do so. So grateful that you want us, that we are your treasure, that, that we're going to be able to bear fruit for you, that we're going to be able to perpetuate your legacy here on earth. Lord, thank you that we are your desire and that you want us more than we want you. Forgive us from the times that we don't focus on that, the times that we lose sight of it. We love you, Jesus. We love you and we want, we want always to do more so that our value will increase. Teach us, Lord, how to raise our price our value to you by the things we've studied tonight and more things. Lord, we pray that you would use us to bear fruit. And as we do prune these bushes, prune us, make us able to bear even more fruit, fruit that lasts, lasting fruit, that every conversation we have with someone result in, in some constant and complete change, some metamorphosis in them. Use us, Lord, to perpetuate your truth. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Fill us with your great love. Let's just sing that, that song that we know by heart, of course. Let your glory fill this house. Let your praises fill our mouths. Let each vessel offer up to you. Sacrifice of praise. You alone are holy. You alone are worthy. You deserve the glory. Jesus, you. sins. That's the atonement for us. 
we overcome all things by the blood of the Lamb. And we ask, Lord, that you would cleanse our bodies tonight. Purge us of all sickness and disease. By your stripes we are healed. Whatever ailments there may be, whatever viruses are lingering, Lord, clean it up quickly. Let it go away. Heal our bodies, Lord. We appreciate what was done. We will not fall asleep prematurely. We appreciate what happened on the cross. The greatest emblem and picture of God's value for us. You so loved us. You sent your own son to die on the cross. And whoever believes it, who believes that you rose, that Jesus rose from the grave, they are the sons and the children of God. Thank you. Thank you that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Because the things you value, you name as your own. Thank you for it. We love you tonight and we ask that as we go from this place, your word would go with us. And that the deposit made would bear much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I smell pizza.